Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, happy Friday. My name is Galina Hill. I'm a co-director of the UC Santa Cruz Center for Analytical Finance. And I would like to welcome you to the second meeting of our speaker series on financial risks, innovation and inclusion, which is also co-sponsored with UC Investments. Uh, today's presentation will be moderated by Yelena Sparukova, who is a professor of finance and the assistant dean for research and external funding at the David Ackel School of Business. And I'm going to now give the word to Yelena. Thank you, Galina. Uh, I am happy to be presenting today to you the speaker, uh, Christine Parlor. And Christine is a uh, Sylvan C. Coleman Chair in Finance and Accounting at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley. I have known Christine now for many years and I have known her for her work in microstructure, theory and complex uh, numerical methods. If you read one of her papers, you will be scared at first, but again, amazing work in both areas. And now, like for the last few years, it's been really, really interesting to see her new path into, into FinTech. Like I'm going to be a little bit personal here when I ask her how she got into this, she said she first had to teach and by learning and teaching, she got interested and now has a full blown research agenda and her most recent work is on the changes in the payment system and also the effect of ba on bank uh, balance sheets. Mm, Christine has published in all major finance journals. She is currently an editor at the Review of Finance and many more things. I'm going to give the floor to Christine. Thank you for coming, Christine. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I should just emphasize that this is a very uh, new field. And so um, I'm learning a tremendous amount and a tremendous amount is changing at the same time. So what I wanted to do today is to just give you some overview of what we call decentralized finance or DeFi. Um, my discussions and my comments are not gonna be particularly technical. Um, if you'd like to have a more detailed discussion with me, uh, just reach out and let me know. Um, <clears throat> so, what does DeFi and where does it start? Where did it come from? So basically most of what we call decentralized finance is built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So Ethereum is relatively new. It was only proposed in late 2013 um, by somebody who um, I have to say as a Canadian is partially Canadian. It only went live in 2015. So the Ethereum blockchain has a native currency uh, called the ETH, and this is used to pay for transactions. And it's essentially the coin of the realm, if you will, where the re realm is the Ethereum blockchain. The actual blockchain works as a proof of work protocol. This is similar to the Bitcoin blockchain there is some discussion about changing the Ethereum protocol to a proof of stake. Um, this is sort of an interesting set of issues and discussions about collateral and whatnot, uh, but effectively you can think of it as just a blockchain. The difference between the Ethereum blockchain and the Bitcoin blockchain is that blocks um, on Ethereum process much more frequently than under Bitcoin. Bitcoin is designed so that on average, a block transacts every 10 minutes, which is incredibly slow. Ethereum is much faster. The whole point behind Ethereum is not to produce a coin or anything like that. The whole point of Ethereum is essentially to create a virtual machine. It's designed to be a publicly observable, verifiable, uh, computer, essentially, that performs simple computing functions. And uh, the way to think about it in terms of sort of uh, computers is uh, Ethereum can do is what is known as Turing complete. 
So uh, basically what this does is it allows you to do the sort of basic things that most programming languages do. So you can do four next loops, you can store and change in internal state, um, you can go out and access other bits of data. Um, in order for this thing to work and to make it sort of viable, so um, it's not subject to attack, um, there's a small little bit of friction uh, thrown into any of the transactions. In particular, execution or performing any uh, one of these sort of computational, basic computations is costly. Um, and so this is in financial markets, we think about say a Tobin tax, right? This is some sort of small friction that's designed to make sure that people don't end up into sort of infinite regresses or infinite loops. Um, so from an economic point of view, it essentially says that there's a little bit of uh, grit or cost thrown into the system. So what does an Ethereum transaction look like? The wonderful thing about all this stuff is that you can do research by Google in the sense that all this material is publicly available. So um, um, Etherscan basically goes through all the different transactions and it tells you that a transaction um, happened at a certain time. Um, a transaction went from a specific location to another specific location and um, information about how much was transacted. So what do these things mean? Um, basically the types of transactions that you can do on the Ethereum blockchain include sending value or tokens or ETH tokens from one address to another. So it's sort of a, you can do value transmission. Two, you can execute a program. So uh, each of the wallet addresses, which are the locations um, that the um, that one interacts with, um, some of those locations can actually contain a function, and that is just sitting there until essentially you send something to that wallet address that essentially pushes the button and makes that function go into operation. Right, and you can pass data to that function. You can do these sorts of things. You can store programs on the Ethereum blockchain. And basically you do that by just sort of sending a program to essentially a generic address and you get a return address where the program resides. The importance of this is that anyone can access the Ethereum blockchain. They can uh, set up a program. In terms of decentralized finance, what that means is anyone can set up a business. And in particular, you can make the mechanics of that business visible by posting the code. Okay. So um, there are some details about how programming works in Ethereum. Um, the most popular language that people use is something called Solidity. Uh, but basically because um, the sort of machine language or you can access the machine language through different interfaces. So this is not really a restriction. There are some uh, blockchains that people have been devising that say um, uh, work best with say Python. Um, but this is just, this is almost like just a simple design feature. So what does all this mean? Um, essentially, the fact that the Ethereum blockchain is this publicly accessible computer means that you can do what are known as smart contracts. What's sort of really irritating is that these contracts aren't smart. They are, as most things designed and work well on machines, they are absolutely literal, right? But what, what kinds of things can these contracts do? They can automatically check conditions, update variables, execute commands, transfer value. And if you think about it, those functions or those actions are pretty much behind any sort of financial contract that we can think of, right? This is, um, you know, you can fit a debt contract, equity contract, you can fit, fit securitization. 
you could pretty much fit any kind of sort of uh, financial, um, um, any financial contract has these uh, basic functions to it. So where do to tokens and coins fit in all this? Well, um, I have the Ethereum blockchain and I can do specific actions on it. How do I want to represent the actions that I've taken? And how do I want to essentially store value associated with any of those actions? Well, I could generate a token or a coin. A token or a coin can represent anything that you want to exchange or store. So in particular, you can think about assets that are backed by tokens or coins. So in particular, we have what are known as stable coins. So these are backed by fiat currency, so US dollars. But you could also have, a, you could have stocks that are backed by coins. I can take an Apple stock, I can put it into escrow, I can issue coins that are based on that escrow account that I could then trade that represent claims to the underlying Apple stock. This is a completely different way of thinking about how to trade and transfer value. You could think about things like copyright. This is a valuable entity. You could think about selling, buying and selling copyright based on a coin. You can have coins that uh, provide access. So you can think about uh, ownership uh, in an organization, voting rights, voting rights that can be traded. You can think about governance generally. You can also think about tokenizing things that are much more specific, uh, like collectibles. Right? You can also think about tokenizing service. I mean, one way to think about tokenization is to say, okay, is there something that is verifiable that I could attach a dollar value to? that I could potentially trade on a market. If there is something along those lines, you can issue a coin or a token to represent what that thing is. Now, the specific sorts of tokens that you have on the Ethereum blockchain are what is known as ERC-20 tokens. Um, these are also relatively recent. The ERC stands for Ethereum Request for Comments, and 20 was just the number that GitHub associated to it because there are multiple requests for comments. And what it does is it's just a protocol, it's a function that can be called that, that does what you need to do to issue claims against some sort of underlying thing of value. So uh, the, the functionality of these ERC tokens you can have balance, transfer, approve, and so forth. And the token contract keeps track of all balances. The ICO um, explosion that we saw a couple of years ago was basically driven by the fact that it was so easy for people who didn't really have expertise to call this, um, uh, this interface and issue tokens. This is why we have one of the reasons why we have so many tokens floating around. What's sort of interesting is um, if you think about things like uh, wrapped Bitcoin or wrapped Ethereum, those are ERC-20 compatible uh, tokens, though uh, Ethereum itself is not compatible with the Ethereum blockchain. I mean, that's sort of a, a, a different side issue. Okay, so we have all these, we have a blockchain. It allows us to generate tokens against things of value. How do we exchange them? I mean, one of the benefits of tokens is not that we have some sort of ownership, but that we can trade the ownership. The trading is what gives us value. So the first sort of wave um, of trading was essentially on uh, large exchanges or trading places. Exchange is a technical word um, that's very much uh, SEC controlled and CFTC controlled. So let's just call them trading places. These are extremely large. They operate as continuous limit order books. So they operate the way most uh, modern equity exchanges offering. 
They also um, provide, the larger exchanges also provide the basic sort of custodian services and um, other sorts of um, uh, useful services that exchanges offer. So they allow you to short, they allow you to trade on margin. And essentially, if you wanna trade on one of these exchanges, what you do is you transfer your tokens or you transfer money uh, to the exchange. The exchange becomes custodian of that and then they allow you to sort of trade. Right? So I'm gonna experiment with these links and see if that's gonna work. Yes, it does. Um, so what I have here is, uh, this is from uh, CoinMarketCap. It's among other things that provides information. It provides information aggregation. Seen, and so what, yeah. Seen, sorry, you have to reshare because we're seeing your PDF, uh, your, uh, uh, your presentation. Go and oh. share the screen and change the share to Chrome, whatever you want us to see. Uh, new share. Share screen and you can. Oh, that's a pain. Okay, thank you. All right. Yep, thank you. Okay, here we go. So this provides us with, um, um, this is from CoinMarketCap. And basically what this gives is, it gives uh, information about the, some of the biggest exchanges. So the biggest by far is Binance. And so this gives the 24 hour volume in US dollars um, across all the different crypto, the cryptocurrencies that it's trading. Um, so as you can see, there are a large number of uh, exchanges, some of which are, um, or many of them are overseas. Some of them, for example, Gemini is basically US based. Uh, but the, there's a massive amount of volume that's being traded in these uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, in case anyone was thinking um, that these um, that cryptocurrencies, I mean, aside from the massive volume, if anyone was thinking that these cryptocurrencies are um, just, you know, the, the provenance of uh, strange and uh, unusual people, there is a large or there is a growing institutional presence in crypto um, and trading. So on Thursday, uh, Square announced that it had purchased uh, $50 million in Bitcoin and uh, as most large institutional transactions happen, this was over the counter. So OTC, they got it from a liquidity provider and essentially they traded the way any large institutional or index fund would trade if it wants to minimize the price impact of its trade. Um, they're gonna keep the Bitcoin in cold storage and they provide a fairly detailed description of their trade process which for people who, who find uh, trading and these sorts of issues interesting, it's absolutely fascinating. Right? Okay, all of this lead up brings us to decentralized finance or DeFi. Um, we talked about what you can do with a smart contract, which is to keep track of information, update balances, change value. If you think about what a, uh, what exchanges do or what trading places do, they do a couple of things. One of them is they allow people to exchange the underlying. The other thing that they do that we think is extremely important is generate prices, right? So what decentralized finance or DeFi exchanges are trying to do is they're essentially trying to rethink how we might want to uh, design a trading process. So a DeFi exchange is essentially a set of contracts that have been thrown out there, literally into the ether or into the Ethereum, um, that basically does, uh, allows people to transfer value. 
Typically with a DeFi exchange, there is no owner or operator. Some of them um, like DYDX, for example, um, basically um, have sort of partial ownership structure where there's partial human intervention, but some are strictly automated. And just to give you some um, sense of uh, This is it. Some sense of size, okay. Can you see the top decentralized uh, exchanges? Yeah, okay. So this gives you some sense. This is also from CoinMarketCap. This gives you some sense of the volume that we're now seeing on these DeFi or decentralized finance exchanges. So the largest is uh, Uniswap, okay. And the 24 hour volume is 288127405. Okay. So we're talking about relatively large uh, dollar volumes here. Okay. These are not some extremely small uh, niche uh, operations. These are, these are large. Mm -hmm. So what is Uniswap? Uniswap was launched in 2018. And what Uniswap does is essentially allows people to swap Ethereum against any other ERC-20 token. Right? So um, the, the types of, uh, the way it's structured is it's just done by smart contract. It's open source and there's no owner. So this is not like um, any kind of uh, financial intermediary that we usually think about where there is somebody who is essentially extracting rents for being the matchmaker. Um, this is just completely uh, decentralized. And the way it works is you send um, Ethereum or your token uh, to a smart contract and the contract sends the other side back, okay? You don't actually have to give up custody of your token. Uh, there's no settlement risk. So in the sense that transactions are atomic, right? They either happen or they don't. Um, if you think about trading through one of these large exchanges that are trading cryptocurrencies, because you have to transfer your tokens or your money to the exchange, there's gonna be a small amount of either credit, credit risk, or other sorts of risks that have to be priced in the transaction if they're not fully regulated and they're not fully uh, guaranteed, then if you give over uh, custody of your things of value, you wanna get recompense for that. So we don't have that kind of settlement risk on things like Uniswap. Um, the, the way Uniswap is structured is every single currency pair essentially has its own uh, pool or exchange. So it's always Ethereum against whatever the token happens to be. If you're an entrepreneur who's designed a new token to do whatever you want it to do, and you want to generate some liquidity for your token, well, you can just create a new exchange or a new pool on uh, Uniswap by essentially using their factory contract. So the idea is that anyone can decide that they're gonna generate this uh, uh, ability to trade the underlying. And in as much as we think that uh, liquidity adds value, if we think that there's a liquidity risk premium, this essentially um, allows people to uh, increase the value of their underlying or the value of their token, okay? So how exactly does it work? Um, this is something that if you come from a sort of economics background, um, you'll start hitting your head against the wall very slowly. Um, so essentially there's, they have what are known as liquidity pools, right? Um, let's suppose that somebody wants to exchange Maker for Ethereum, 
right? So you can think of this as exchange of stable coin for Ethereum. What you do is you basically put in Maker to one of these liquidity pools, okay? And the liquidity, you get the Ethereum back, right? And the liquidity pool collects a fee for the fact that this transaction happened. If you want to, to um, put this into um, a standard sort of trading context, essentially what this looks like is starting to look like is um, almost like a different type of rationing rule in a limit order market. I don't know if that analogy is helpful for anyone, uh, but instead of um, orders going through price and time priority, essentially you're just getting rid of both of those and anyone who supplies liquidity is getting some sort of premium as a function of the amount of liquidity that's demanded, okay? So uh, how do you become one of these liquidity suppliers? Well, anyone could become a liquidity provider. Um, in order to become a liquidity provider, you identify the pool that you wanna apply liquidity um, to, and you essentially provide Ethereum and a token of equal value that's the other side of that pool. So you basically put both sides into Uniswap, right? And you get a liquidity token in return. That liquidity token is specific to the pool that you uh, provided points to. And this is the thing that increases or decreases in value um, that based on the number of trades that happen against the pool that you've been sitting your, your token in. Um, the liquidity token, whenever you want to, can be redeemed uh, for Ethereum and the token back again. Um, so, um, uh, this just gives you uh, some sense of volumes, right? Um, and this was from sort of an interest, I'm going to talk about what this massive spike was or uh, drop was. Um, but basically just this gives you some sense of um, uh, what the liquidity pools look like um, on Uniswap. And so the top tokens are ether, ether wrapped. So this is Ethereum that you can actually use on the Ethereum blockchain. The Tether, the USD or USDC, these are stable coins. Right? Uh, wrapped Bitcoin, Bitcoin is also something that you can use on the, wrapped Bitcoin is what you can use on the Ethereum blockchain. So what was this, this little kerfuffle here? A massive drop in liquidity. Well, um, this is sort of one of the reasons why DeFi is sort of interesting. It's because it's an industry that's in flux and is changing. There was something known as uh, sushi swap, okay? um, and essentially this was a fork of uh, Uniswap. And what they did, and the reason why you saw this sort of massive drop in liquidity uh, on Uniswap, is um, essentially they offered a, a premium to Uniswap liquidity providers because they were essentially uh, attempting to compete with the liquidity provision on Uniswap, right? Um, once it became clear uh, that SushiSwap was not going to be uh, a dominant liquidity provider, the liquidity providers returned to Uniswap. Um, okay, so this just gives you a little bit more detail about how the, uh, the fees work on uh, Uniswap. Let me um, uh, let me uh, just mention briefly uh, version two, which is sort of the update, uh, the updated uh, uh, version of Uniswap. This came in May 2020. Um, it's uh, essentially got more bells and whist whistles than version one. Right? Um, and what it does, I mean, so when you think about foreign exchange, you always have uh, the pairs that are directly convertible. 
So if you want to trade and you can no longer trade or and there's no sort of direct to direct trade of the two instruments that you want, uh, Uniswap version two will essentially allow uh, trading between uh, the, the sort of the minimum cost uh, route to trade two different tokens against each other if there's no, no existing liquidity there. Um, they've also sort of, um, or they've also expanded the set of tokens that they issue um, and they have a governance token. Um, there are a couple of uh, issues on um, Uniswap because anyone could enter into, there's no sort of curation. People have listed fake tokens on Uniswap and typically the way people list fake tokens is they have, they have a token name that's similar to an existing token. Right? Um, there was the SushiSwap issue and um, given that SushiSwap happened, um, something else will probably happen that's similar to SushiSwap, but may or may not be a better, better system. Um, there are some issues about the costs associated with uh, trading uh, and trading activity. Right? But it seems that this idea is um, astoundingly powerful. Right? If, you know, historically we've thought that the, the matchmakers who match liquidity demanders and liquidity suppliers basically make rents. And it's quite possible that this decentralized finance once the kinks are worked out, um, is going to be the future model of exchanges, right? If you think about the costs of trading equity or the costs of trading, these are plummeted. These have plummeted um, over time. Uh, but there's still a little bit more to be extracted from the system. And decentralized finance will basically really, really reduce these costs of trading. Uh, what's sort of interesting, interesting is uh, when we talked about the sort of traditional crypto exchanges, if there is such a thing, uh, the biggest one is Binance. Binance has said that it's going to move to an automated market making model similar to these Uniswap liquidity pools. So it seems that this is going to be a, or that it, it seems that uh, many different types of organizations are experimenting with essentially this new model of liquidity supply, right? And um, yeah, okay. So going forward, um, the, the Ethereum blockchain and or just essentially this idea of a virtual machine, it essentially means that there are many different um, experiments and formats. Um, there are some corporate solutions. So JP Morgan, uh, there's some large, also one of the big four accounting firms. These are using the Ethereum blockchain to store information and to automate uh, pretty obvious uh, transactions. Right? Um, there's still a little bit of uncertainty or unclear regulatory space. Um, so with regulatory uncertainty, there's always sort of this issue about what's going to happen. Uh, but many, many different models are possible. Essentially, the transaction costs have plummeted for uh, these basic sort of financial um, contracts. Um, whether or not we think that uh, securitizing specific actions and trading them, which is what a token can do, is a good thing, um, or whether or not it's a bad thing, um, time will tell, uh, but certainly this is something that we're going to see uh, happening. So with that, I wonder if there are any questions or I'll turn it over to Elena. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Like there is, uh, there is uh, questions and I'm going to start like taking my privilege here with mine. Actually, we'll rope uh, those, uh, those questions uh, too. So uh the first the first you said this is the future of exchange and like strictly finance speaking we can be expanding right those as you mentioned already the exchanges to be 
like coins against Google or any stocks or any any contracts uh, we would uh, want. And this, of course, like I think, will define also the future of high frequency trading and such. So like uh, maybe postpone to a little bit later because this might be too much. Like is this is this going to redefine how we think about automated trading and what speed means? And also like I wanted to ask like rolling back like this is contracts that we already know very well and they're just being differently implemented uh, so like is there room for something that is a contract that we did not think could exist in the old world and now is possible with um with those smart uh, smart contracts also like i'm going to go to the question from alexandra cox if transaction costs have gone down already so much, why do we look at smart uh, smart contracts or um, those new forms DeFi exchanges? Like if if already we are dealing with very very um, like very small cost, and also like Alexandra is asking, can you give an example of transactions of real goods using uh, DeFi? Lots of questions choose how to order them. Um, okay, so um, let me um, let me start with the second, as I understand it. So um, what's interesting, I think, about DeFi is not that the actions that are being taken are so fundamentally different, which is you have something of value, I've got a store of value and let's exchange them, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of, we've been doing that since the Neanderthals were driven out of Germany, right? Um, what's sort of interesting about DeFi is that it changes the cost of experimenting with new uh, types of, uh, marketplaces and market structures, right? So basically these liquidity pools are unbundling or changing the way in which people get remun remunerated for providing liquidity. And it's a new market form. And I think uh, sort of the, if, if you try to do something like this on the New York Stock Exchange, essentially what you'd have to do is you'd have to say, well, okay, if there's a transaction at any point in time, any single person who has provided liquidity and is sitting in the limit order book, even though their order didn't execute, will get some amount of um, the liquidity premium, right? Or the, the benefit. And that's a, just a complete, the amount of information um, and the record keeping and, um, the sort of very, very difficult to implement currently unless you have something like these smart contracts. So one way to think about it is it allows us to experiment or it allows us to innovate uh, business models and auction models that we hadn't even thought were possible. You asked a little bit about uh, how we think about speed. So one thing that's really very strange about uh, uh, Ethereum and how we think about speed is um, time in Ethereum is measured in terms of blocks. So time is discrete, right? If you think about the New York Stock Exchange, time is continuous and um, you know, the discussions that people have had about, say, speed bumps on exchanges, you know, IEX and so forth, essentially what they're saying is, look, we want to uh, make it difficult for high frequency traders to uh, trade preemptively, which is the po polite way of describing it. Um, and so we're going to introduce a speed bump, right? Whether or not those work and how they work, I mean, this is a, a question, but it's essentially the fact that time is con continuous in the real world. In Ethereum, time is in blocks. So the way the code works is um, the transactions get executed in the order in which they appear in the blocks. 
the order in which they appear in the blocks is essentially determined by uh, the gas prices or the fees that people associate with their transactions. So in particular, if I want to front run you, and then I can do that, I can do that by associating a slightly higher gas price to my transaction, and it's going to go in before yours, and it's going to be executed before yours. And so this has led to a whole cottage industry of what are known as flash loans. A flash loan is a loan that I make you that basically you take out at the beginning of a block and you pay back by the end of the block and you use that value that I've moved into your account essentially in order to do some sort of arbitrage trade. And it's sort of a different way of thinking about high frequency trade. It's a different way of thinking about automated trade uh, but I mean, it has the same sort of economic elements as our, um, as our basic, um, the, the basic things that we worry about, right? But there are these structural differences. Um, in terms of uh, costs, why is this cheaper? Uh, yes, it is absolutely true that on equity markets, um, the costs measured by spreads and so forth have been declining over time, right? But there are lots of other costs that are associated with equity trading. So in particular, you can think about make-take fees, which typically are never measured or very difficult to measure accurately. You can think about market access fees. You can think about broker's commissions who do smart order routing. All these things are part of the costs of managing an equity portfolio. Um, and they are not, let's just say they're not zero. So even though spreads have declined, there are these other costs that are sitting there. And so the question is whether or not we can design a system that squeezes out what essentially the intermediaries have been obtaining by uh, automating uh, a trading process. And this is the purpose of the smart contracts. So in, um, um, I have a, a research paper with my collaborator, um, Alfred Lehar at the University of Calgary that um, basically looks at the rents that Bitcoin miners have managed to extract from people by strategically manipulating capacity. Uh, or we think that that's what's going on. So it's quite possible that you cannot get rid of these intermedi intermediary rents by moving to a smart contract, uh, but maybe you can, which is sort of why, um, why there's this experiment. Um, in terms of examples of real goods, um, you've absolutely stumped me. I can't, can't come up with a specific concrete um, um, off the top of my head. There have been though, there are. Um, and these are essentially uh, people take something of value, a house, tokenize it, and then use it to transfer, uh, to transfer ownership. So uh, these happen and happen rarely. Um, that's just because um, one of the reasons you know, what markets do you see transactions in at a high frequency? Well, you see them in things that are designed or have more value because we could trade them, which is um, where the interested tokens and trading the tokens come from. And, and tokens that are claims to um, either, you know, commonly used services, fiat money, and so forth. More questions. So, like, what are the institutional, what is the institutional investment proportion in this? Are, is there a large portion? How are the institutional investors uh, getting comfortable with this? And maybe, like, together with this question, I'll slap uh, two questions of mine, right? So, UK banned trading in uh, derivatives, uh, derivatives of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so, like, why is this? And, like, I think institutions uh, would have interest in derivatives uh, uh, 
uh, of cryptocurrency. So what is what is the derivative world looking like? And again, the institutional investors. And could you speak to the potential for national digital currencies issued by nations uh, or mm, super nation nations like the EU? And also, like I'm slapping to this one about the security, like there were three fifty one percent attacks right this summer. For those of us who are like getting our pinky into the water and learning, like the news was with mm, the 51% attacks, uh, if you could speak to the security of this type of attacks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, um, I'm not feeling ambitious enough to actually go back to a share screen mode. So let me just uh, encourage people to Google yield farming. So um, one of the, um, a large amount of the money that is sitting around in, um, in these liquidity pools, um, essentially you retain ownership of your token um, and you also get um, these sort of liquidity premium. So the, um, the returns that people get are astoundingly large. They're astoundingly large, partially because um, the risk is not priced correctly, as I understand it, in, uh, in calculating the returns. But um, there's, there's sort of an interest in holding your tokens in a way that, that, that generates these rents. Um, one of the reasons why um, there's, okay, so there has been institutional uptake of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin uh, seems to be in a kind of pharma Frenchy way, a risk factor in crypto markets. So people wanna have exposure to it. Uh, the CME experiment with uh, Bitcoin, future, uh, Bitcoin futures, um, there's sort of interest in this. It hasn't completely taken off yet. Um, one of the reasons why is a lot of the sort of mechanics that institutional traders need in order to trade uh, crypto, like um, you know, uh, um, borrowing, shorting, all this kind of stuff. Um, if you want to do a slightly sophisticated uh, portfolio strategy, that that is not really completely, the markets are not completely organized. So it's much more difficult to short than it is to, than it is say for equities where it's very easy to go out and borrow or there's a well-defined market for doing it. Um, that is changing. There are companies, for example, like BitGo that is trying to uh, develop these sort of this, this institutional back office that you might need if you want to if you want to trade in bulk. The fact that Square went out and found an alternate liquidity provider and managed to trade a massive amount of Bitcoin, a pretty, pretty large amount of Bitcoin with little or no price impact essentially says that these services are developing. In terms of um, European, there is a, uh, so in, um, I'm, my understanding of the international, because the regulations changed so much and um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know in Germany, it's actually easy for retail investors to get exposure to crypto indices. So there are some banks that are actually offering what look like uh, an index or an ETF product that is correlated with changes in Bitcoin. So. Uh, you know, as this market develops, as it becomes more and more clear that this is something of interest, um, you know, more and more retail investors will have access to this. At the moment in the US, it's a little bit clunky because as a retail investor, do I really want a wallet? Do I have to do this? Do I have, yeah, I can do it, but it's not as quite as easy as it is to say, get ETFs through my brokerage house. This will happen, this will happen. Um, it's just a question of making sure that the regulatory environment is consistent with how people can trade. And there's a, there was some legislation that was offered in Congress about I think last week about a new def definition of digital assets that will make things easier. Uh, but as we all know, there's sort of a lot going on in DC at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, CBDC or central bank digital currency, um, this is the thing that everyone is talking about 
um, it seems like a lot of the um, the oh, how can I say this? So there there are a couple of issues that come up. One is um, in the U.S. the financial system works sort of okay. Um, so C CBDC, it's not clear how much value that would add. If you have a country like, so for example, Uruguay, they had their IPESO experiment. And this was extremely useful because it helped people who are unbanked or underbanked um, have access to modern financial instruments. So I think you're gonna see CBDC coming, uh, becoming more relevant um, in smaller jurisdictions where people are unbanked or underbanked. So we've had the Eastern Caribbean Monetary Union has issued a CBDC. Uh, there's the EDNR in Tunisia. So those, we're seeing a little bit of that. In terms of uh, big powerhouse currencies issuing CBDC, um, we'll see. I mean, the, the Chinese Central Bank has been pretty aggressive and they're going to, um, they're moving ahead. Um, whether or not people want to denominate contracts, international contracts in Renmibi, uh, we'll see. Um, it's quite possible things like stable coins will actually be um, more uh, or used or they're much more easy to use, I guess, than anything that's issued by a CBDC. So those are essentially private solutions. Um, a lot of central banks, so for example, I was talking to people at the Ricks Bank, they're, they're very worried about uh, private solutions that um, are essentially uh, digital currency because they think their mandate is in fact to provide a means of exchange for their population. So, you know, the discussions are ongoing, uh, we'll see. There, um, there are a lot of very interesting experiments. So uh, in Canada, we've had the Jasper project um, and they're actively discussing whether or not they're gonna, you know, institute this, institute something uh, but they're, for central banks in, in countries like Canada, it's, it's much more problematic. It's, it's very difficult just because the private system works so well, even though Visa is taking, you know, five or 10% uh, from small merchants. Um, the last thing that I want to say about CBDC is, um, you know, um, in any particular economy, you have the sort of retail investors and how they pay for things. And then you have the institutional investors um, so bank to bank. So the more effective implementations of CBDC are actually on the wholesale market. So bank to bank. Um, so we have like the Ubin project in Singapore. Um, they are, they are, they're moving ahead. Right? Um, in terms of security, the it is, it's, in, it's impossible to, um, systems are only made as safe as problems that we know about, right? So um, our, our blockchains and this sort of decentralized finance, is it more or less risky uh, than other uh, forms of value transfer. Um, people know about cold storage. They know about not having things that are essentially on internet connected machines. They know about, you know, um, storing things in ways that are difficult to steal. People understand um, uh, incentives uh, for people to, you know, fork or mine false blocks and do this other thing. So um, the risks that people are aware of are certainly risks that are being managed and observed carefully. The risks that people aren't aware of, obviously these are things that haven't transpired yet and who knows. But I should also point out that when the Bank of Bangladesh 
had a massive draining of reserves, it came about because somebody stole their SWIFT credentials. Um, so any system, even um, you know the the stuff held in the vault in New York, the Federal Reserve, um, is there's a possibility of malfeasance. Unfortunately, that is the world we live in. I'm not sure if I answered anyone's questions correctly. It's sort of, I'm still drinking my coffee, um, but please follow up if I've, if I've missed something. Yeah, there, is, there is one more, bear with me to scroll down. And um, I'm going to read it. Uh, I realized that no one might have 100% visibility or 100% accuracy, that's it. Could you also speak to, the, um, to what the crypto world blockchain uh, world might look like in 10 years. Uh, for example, major trends and tailwinds, uh, growth of cold storage and other uh, currently less visible and growing trends. This would be the closing question. I think uh, a huge amount is going to depend on uh, what the regulators do. So um, Innovation is only possible if you have a well-developed regulation or regulatory framework and everything is all over the map at the moment. So um, there are so many different, um, there's so much uncertainty um, about, you know, international monetary system and all this kind of other stuff, but it's very, very difficult, certainly for me to predict which way it's going to go. Um, if you have a stable jurisdiction that allows people to trade and to innovate and to use crypto, I think that's going to become that where who, whoever or wherever that jurisdiction is, is going to become absolutely dominant. Um, the, the thing about uh, crypto is that it is very, very difficult to trace. It is difficult to... Um, there, because there's no sort of central authority, uh, the money flows and the value flows are very difficult to trace. So it is truly a global, it is, it is truly global. And uh, the jurisdiction that allows it to be comfortable and to have a home is going to be the jurisdiction um, that succeeds in this. <laughs> Thank you. I think this we're at 10.59 and so time has come for us to thank you so very much for this discussion. And this is a request that I don't know even if it's possible, but maybe we're at level one. And for those who are level two uh, interested in the topic, uh, like if there is a recommendation, not here, but like share with the organizer something that uh, we could go and uh, what would be our next step to educate ourselves. Uh, on the on the issues. Uh, again, this might be too difficult of a task, but if possible, uh, for the interest, it would be really nice to have a reading list or like even a website uh, list where we could visit and learn a little bit. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine and Elena for this uh, really interesting and educational discussion. And thank you for the audience for participating. Thank, Thank you. you. The organizers too.